Good morning. And welcome to the next little church of Christ. It is so good to see you this morning. And as we go through the services, we hope and pray that the thing is going to be said shortly and sing our singing, our prayer will be enlightening. And also you'll be blessed when you leave this afternoon. If you are a visitor for the first time, we ask you to please complete a connection card and drop it in the collection tray before you exit the building this morning. We certainly appreciate that. Davin will be reading the scripture for, for us this morning. After that, Chris will begin our services with songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Before I take my seat, I would like to compliment the brothers from last week. They did a fantastic job coming up front and uh, participating in the services because they did exactly what we wanted them to do in our meeting. And as we do that today, and the sun is thereafter, please come forth like you did last Sunday. I mean, it was great. I mean, it was fantastic. I, I was impressed. Matter of fact, I was ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate that. So at this time, we're going to ask Davin to come forth and read our scripture. After that, then we'll get into our song, song services. Davin. Jesus spoke with all things at the crowd parable in the parables. <clears throat> he did not say anything to them without using a parable. So fulfilled, so was fulfilled. What was spoken through the prophet? I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. As we begin our song service this morning, would you please stand with me? First song will be Father, I Adore You. Father, I adore you, and I lay my life before you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Let's really clear out our lungs this morning. Let us sing out what we intend to be. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard of the I will labor every 
want to trust in Jesus' power to save, all who will truly come shall find a happy home in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. Amen. Bow with me, please. Our Father and our God, we reverence your holy name. We bow our heads in pure humility because you are the awesome God. And Father, we're ever so thankful that we can be called saints, children of the living God. We're thankful for the grace in which we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're ever so thankful that he went to that cruel cross and died for each and every one of us that we may yet live. And Father, we put our heads this morning down in, in shame, in pure humility, because we've tried so hard each and every day of our lives to, to do what's right. And there are times that we slip up and do things that we know are wrong. And Father, we ask for forgiveness, but the only bad thing about it, God, is many times we even do it again. And we ask that you continue through thy, thy son's blood to forgive us. You're the one that looks into the heart. We can't. We can fool one another, but we can't fool the almighty God. And Father, if you see within our hearts that we're trying our very best, that's what we hope for. Because when this life is over, you have promised us a home in heaven for each and every one of us. We don't know what kind of jobs you're going to have us doing. We don't think we'll be sitting around and just singing all the time. But we're not sure what's going to be happening. But we know we live in a world that's so beautiful, but it can't compare to what heaven's going to be. And Father, there are those at home now that are hurting. There are some in the hospital that are hurting. And we appeal to the great physician that you comfort them, that they won't hurt near as bad. After all, we go to the great physician, the doctor. He can heal it all. We pray that you'll watch over and care for us throughout the rest of this service. And what we do is acceptable in your sight. For that's the only reason we're here. In his name. Amen. For those of you who remember this next song, you can blame Quaku on. I know he led it once, and uh, I've loved it ever since. And I catch myself singing it about every day that I turn on my last road before I get home. I love the, love the sound that it makes, and I love the sound of listening to other churches here. Uh, I hope and I know that I'm going to love the sound of the way we sing. Let's please stand. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divine is comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell, for I know Cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread, though my wit 
recess may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, though a spring of joy I see, gushing from the rock before me, though a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, all the fullness of his love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit, clothed in mortal, wings is fly to realms of day. This my soul through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my soul through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Okay, thanks for letting me get settled here, but good morning, everyone. Really good to see all of you, really great to worship with all of you. Thank you, Chris, for leading our singing. Um, it's interesting to me that apparently we haven't sung that song in many years. I love that song, and I also heard it growing up a lot, and so thank you for leading it, and it ties in well with some of what I want us to think about this morning. Uh, but I'm excited for this morning because we start a new series. Uh, we'll start the next phase of our theme for this year. Uh, this morning. And as we do that, I want to begin with a question. Uh, can you name someone in your life or picture someone in your life who taught you a great deal and who left a really lasting impact on you? Can you think of someone like that who taught you and made such an impact on your life? Uh, it could be a teacher from when you were in school or some of you are still in school, but it could be a teacher uh, who was especially effective in the way they taught, and you really connected with how they taught, and, and you really respected them uh, as well. Uh, it could be a, a coach or a trainer, if you were in athletics uh, at any point. Uh, perhaps this coach uh, not only taught you how to excel at that sport, whatever it was, but they also modeled upstanding character, and they were uh, great examples. Or it could be someone who taught you art, or taught you music, or taught you some particular skill, and they really loved what they were teaching, and they really loved seeing other people fall in love with the same thing that they were in love with. Or it could be someone who maybe um, hasn't been in a formal teaching role like that, uh, but through their life and through your relationship with them, they taught you a great deal. Perhaps it's a parent or a grandparent, an older sibling or uh, a close friend of some kind, some kind of relationship where someone taught you a great deal. Do you have someone in your mind who fits that kind of description, who made that kind of impact on you? Well, on the screen here is a picture of a man uh, named Jim Gardner. Uh, he is a professor uh, at Fried Hardman University where, where Kelsey and I both went to college. Dr. Gardner is a very impressive individual. Uh, he's one of the most unique men I've ever met, and I think Kelsey would agree. Uh, he's also one of the most intelligent and one of the most compassionate. His formal training is as a lawyer. Uh, he went to law school at Yale, very prestigious place to get uh, a law degree. But he has dedicated himself beyond law to all kinds of fields of study. He's very thoroughly self-educated as well. And after a successful career as a lawyer, he felt like one of the most meaningful things he could do with his life uh, was teach young people about the Bible and about the Christian faith. And other, other um, they educate them in other ways, but do it from a Christian perspective. And that's what brought him to Fried Hardeman University. 
And he was really famous, is really famous, he still teaches there. He's really famous around campus for teaching and when he preaches in chapel, uh, for teaching and preaching straight from his Greek New Testament. Now, when I get up in the pulpit and when the average person gets up in the pulpit, they have an English translation. Not Dr. Gardner. He's got the Greek text and he'll just translate it off the cuff as he's teaching or preaching. I also spotted him once in the school cafeteria with his Hebrew Old Testament open and nothing else open around him to help him. Just his Hebrew Old Testament, just reading away. Uh, He's a very impressive individual. And he's kind of old school in his approach to teaching, but he is extremely effective as a teacher. Uh, Something about the way he speaks, and I don't really know what it is. He has kind of that elusive quality that just makes everyone pay attention so easily. And whether he's teaching in class or speaking in chapel there, it's not uncommon for him to be deeply moved by what he's saying and, and get emotional. Uh, He's also just lived a fascinating life. Uh, He's at least in his 60s, maybe in his 70s by now, and at least as of a few years ago, he was still regularly running in marathons. And as far as I know, he actually still does that. He's also been an avid mountain climber, and he's climbed some of the most dangerous mountains in the world. He's a very impressive person. And most importantly, he practices what he preaches and teaches. That is what is most important. Uh, he's traveled with college students on mission trips, and he's been involved uh, in building up the church all over the world. This pic on the, uh, on the screen here is actually not of him at Fried Hardman. It's him teaching at a church in South Korea. Um, and he is certainly a man to imitate. And I'm really grateful that, uh, that I had the opportunity to have him as a teacher. But that's my example. All of us, I'm sure, have someone in our life, or perhaps multiple people in our lives, who made a lasting impact on us uh, because of how they taught us and because of what they taught us. Jesus was a teacher, um, and Scripture tells us he was a very effective teacher. Jesus was called many things while he was on earth, uh, but one common way people referred to him was simply as teacher or as the teacher. People who heard him teach regularly were amazed by what he said and how he said it. The Gospel of John tells us that on one occasion, Jewish officers said that no one ever spoke like Jesus could speak. And one of the main ways Jesus taught was through parables. And in our scripture reading that Davin read a few moments ago, uh, Matthew tells us of an occasion where everything Jesus taught was in the form of a parable. This was a major teaching strategy uh, of Jesus. And the parable is probably the most memorable form of Jesus' teachings. The short stories of Jesus' parables easily stick with us. We easily remember them, and so they can easily make a big impact uh, on us. And through these short, memorable stories uh, called parables, Jesus teaches us what his kingdom is like, what his Father is like. He teaches us how we are supposed to treat one another, And he teaches us what really matters in life. So much about what following Jesus is all about is captured in his parables. And so for the next phase of our theme for this year, we're going to spend some time learning from our teacher by learning from his parables. We're going to learn from the parables of Jesus. And so what I'd like us to do this morning is consider how Jesus intends for us to hear his parables and consider how his parables when we understand their message and let the message take root in our heart, how his parables can shape us into more faithful followers of Jesus. Maybe you've heard parables uh, summed up before as earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. It's a common way of defining um, a parable. And that definition uh, captures well the spiritual message that Jesus is trying to teach us with his parables, Um, But it doesn't quite do do justice, I think, to the change Jesus is trying to bring about in our lives through his parables. Uh, It's true that that parables can be, we can call them earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. But in another sense, they're really earthly stories with earthly meanings. They are meant to change our lives here on this earth, uh, here and now, while while we're on this earth. Jesus' parables are often meant to direct our minds to how we're living now and consider them in light of the will of his Father. A good way that uh, a number of people have summed up what Jesus' parables are meant to do is that they are meant to tease the mind into active thought. Parables are meant to tease the mind into active thought. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, Jesus' parables, they are meant to tell us a story, a story that we can understand pretty easily. Uh, It's not typically very complicated, but they're also meant to get us thinking past the story and get the gears in our minds turning. They are meant to set our minds up to discern what is the deeper truth behind uh, these parables and consider where we belong in the story of the parable and consider whether or not we will live differently in light of what our minds have come to realize by thinking carefully about the story that Jesus has told. We sometimes assume that Jesus' parables show, um, Jesus told his parables so that everyone could understand his teachings more clearly. We sometimes assume that, and that certainly makes good sense to us. Uh, Sometimes our minds can understand something that is told in story form better than when it is told to us directly. And also, if you've grown up in church or if you've been in church for quite some time, uh, you may have heard the interpretation of Jesus' parables for years in sermons and in Bible classes, and so sometimes their message can seem pretty plain to us uh, for that reason. But Jesus actually tells us that he intends his parables to make his teachings clearer to some people and less clear to others. Not everyone is meant to fully understand what Jesus teaches through his parables. And sure enough, Jesus' parables sometimes confused people. Uh, Jesus' disciples... Uh, got a couple instances here on the screen. They have to approach Jesus after he teaches parables sometimes and ask him what the parable meant. In Mark's version of our scripture reading uh, for this morning, in Mark's version of it, um, Mark writes that Jesus would explain the meaning of his parables, but he would only do it to his disciples and he would only do it in private. And the rest of the people who heard these parables were not um, given these kinds of explanations. And so not everyone understood Jesus' parables. Only his disciples, only those who followed him, that's what a disciple means. Only his disciples could, could understand them most clearly. So how can we be those people? How can we be the people who understand? How can we be the people who see things more clearly uh, because of Jesus' parables instead of less clearly? Well, notice... What Jesus says, this is in Mark chapter 4, right after he speaks a couple of parables and right before he's going to speak some more. This is Mark 4, 24 and 25. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Jesus says, pay attention to what you hear. That is the key, paying attention. And what Jesus goes on to say in verse 25 can sound a little harsh at first, but in the context of understanding Jesus' parables, it actually makes very good sense. The one who has, the one who has been paying attention and is willing to be taught will be given more. They will understand more. But from the one who has not, because they haven't been paying attention and they don't want to be taught, even what he has will be taken away. They will only understand less and less, and they will be more confused by Jesus over time. And that is, in fact, the way it tends to go. Those who are willing to listen and be taught by Jesus tend to understand him better over time. Those who are unwilling to listen are often easily confused and their confusion only makes Jesus even less appealing to them, to them. And so if we want to learn from Jesus the teacher, we have to pay attention and we have to be willing to be taught. That is how we learn from him. And that is how we are also prepared to keep on learning for, uh, from him throughout our lives. Learning from Jesus is a journey. It's a lifelong journey. And Jesus' parables are are part of that journey. And the Gospel of Luke actually draws that out, how the parables are part of our our lifelong journey of learning from Jesus. It draws that out in a very interesting way. Luke has uh, a number of parables that the other Gospels do not have. And several, many of those parables come to us while Jesus is on a journey of his own. 
A number of those parables come to us while he is on the journey to Jerusalem. And you can see here on the screen that he begins this journey to Jerusalem in Luke 9, 51. And just a few verses before that journey begins, we are told that this journey will end in his departure, and that departure will occur at Jerusalem. And so this is a reference to Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, all of which will happen right around Jerusalem. And so Jesus leaves for this journey in Luke chapter 9, but he doesn't actually arrive until Luke 19.28. So for about 10 chapters in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is on the road. And Luke doesn't want us to forget that Jesus is on the road either. Uh, Throughout these chapters, and you can see this on the screen, he keeps reminding us, Luke keeps reminding us that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, the place where he will be betrayed and arrested, put to death, and then where he will rise again. Just before Jesus sets out on this journey to Jerusalem, uh, to the place where he will be hung on a cross, just before he sets out on that journey, he tells his followers that they must take up their crosses daily and follow him. And, And this is Luke's version of our theme verse for the year. Jesus tells that just before he sets out on this journey. And then all along this journey, to the place of the cross, Jesus teaches, and he teaches a lot in parables. And you can see the parables that are are mentioned as part of this journey on the screen. And this actually isn't even all of them. I, I couldn't fit them all on the screen. He teaches a lot of parables while he's on the road to Jerusalem. And so what is Jesus doing? As he's journeying towards Jerusalem to do the will of his Father, he's teaching us how to follow him and do the will of the Father every day. Jesus' parables teach us how to follow him. They teach us how to follow him all through our journey in this life. And just as Jesus' journey ended not in death, but in resurrection and glory, ours will end that way as well if we follow in his steps. Jesus has a lot to teach us, and what he teaches speaks to our deepest needs, our greatest fears, and also our greatest desires. He can teach us what life is all about, but we have to listen, and we have to be willing. We have to be eager to be taught, and so I'm looking forward to listening to him together through this next phase of our series. This morning, if you want to begin your journey with Jesus by being united with him in baptism, uh, or if you have any other uh, requests, requests for prayer, or anything else, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and while Chris leads us in our song of invitation. All things are ready, come to the feast, come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation. Stop. 
could have switched both of these songs and this could have been the invitation the song that we just sang all things are ready come to the feast those of us who have responded to the invitation of Christ I hope we realize that we truly we feast on the love of God and we drink everlasting life and we wish that for everybody in the world this morning as we take time now to think of the Lord's Supper I want us to comprehend and to focus on that in this moment we do truly surrender all to Jesus. Let us sing. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his prayer. Sometimes leaders are put in tough positions. No, I'm not talking about leaders of our country. And I'm not even talking about leaders of our church. In John chapter 18 and 19, the people brought Jesus before Pontius Pilate. They brought him in front of Pilate because they believed he had committed an offense that was worthy of execution. The Roman governor, Pilate, was the only one who was capable of making the call whether or not to execute Jesus. The problem, though, was that Pilate found no basis of a charge for execution. 
There were many times in the scriptures where Pilate says, I have found no basis for a charge against this man. And in Matthew, he even washes his hands in front of the crowd and says, I am innocent of his blood. It's on your hands. Eventually, Pilate gave Jesus over to the crowd and ordered him. Before he gave him to the crowd, he tried to get out of the execution by doing all things possible. In in chapter 19 of John, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, but this didn't satisfy the crowd. So eventually he gave him up to be crucified. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we don't understand your ways sometimes. We don't understand why decisions are made that they are. We don't understand the way that you work. And it's really not up to us to understand because we know that you have everything figured out already. We thank you for sending Jesus to die for us, to save us from our sins. We thank you for the body that was broken. We ask that you bless this bread that represents that body. In Jesus' name, amen. As Jesus was nailed to the cross with what we could picture now as railroad spikes, blood flowed down from a man who was beaten, bruised, battered, with a crown of thorns on his head to to symbolize the king of the Jews. And it's only because of this blood that we are saved that we have a hope of being with him forever. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that was made. We thank you for sending your one and only son that blood would be shed, but it's on our hands. We ask that you bless this cup that represents the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name. Separate and apart from communion, we typically uh, take this time to offer our first fruits to God. And I say first fruits because our giving to the Lord should come first. It should be at the top of our list and the top of our priorities because God will provide all else. If you'd like to uh, contribute today, we have collection plates in the front and back of the auditorium as well as online giving on our website. Will you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, it's not much, but we offer, you this, uh, we, we offer you this offering that it will be used to bless someone else in this community, in this uh, congregation. We ask that you be with those who, uh, who make the decisions on how to spend, that it will be used in the best way possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for worshiping with us uh, this morning. Uh, Before we have our closing song and closing prayer, I don't have too terribly many announcements, but I want to make us aware of just a couple. Uh, Again, Don't forget about our collection plate here, and there's also one in the back door, and there's also our service donation box as well in the back. I encourage you to to make whatever contribution that uh, you determine is appropriate in your heart for uh, for that. Um, Also, this Wednesday night, uh, we will have a new Bible class starting. 
uh, we have finished up our summer series. This Wednesday night Bible class, you can see the title of it here. It's called Why Live for Jesus? Uh, and it's an introduction to Christian apologetics, which basically means thinking through why we believe what we do about God and about Jesus and why we end up committing our lives to Jesus, why we live for Jesus. And so um, if you are uh, perhaps quite confident why you believe what you do, uh, this still may be a class that blesses you. Uh, or if you have some questions and some doubts and some, some uncertainties, I think it's also a class to really uh, address and, and, and talk through those things. And it's also a class, I think, that can equip us a little bit for conversations with people we know, uh, who we encounter uh, in our daily lives, who perhaps don't know the Lord and don't live for Jesus and could equip us to have meaningful conversations with them. So it will start this Wednesday uh, at 7. I encourage you to be there for that. Uh, we also have the Lads to Leaders potluck. I mentioned that last week, and I'll mention it again. It will be on the 12th. Um, I know Mary Carpenter is not here this morning, but I believe she is the person to see about being involved with that. Is that correct? So perhaps contact Mary Carpenter uh, if you're interested in being involved with that. But the Lads to Leaders kickoff potluck is scheduled for the 12th. Also, Ladies Bible Study will be starting back soon in September. Uh, so ladies, just be staying tuned for details on that. Um, but that will be resuming in September. Um, oh, one other announcement I know. Uh, we mentioned a few weeks ago involvement forms that we have um, now, and that will, help us, uh, that will help us know what people are, how people perhaps feel they are best equipped to serve. And we want to, to, um, we want to equip people, we want to put people into service in ways that fit with uh, how they feel they are best equipped. And the involvement forms will help us do that. And those are in the back. Uh, so I encourage you, if you have not taken one of those and filled it out, to please do that. Are there any other announcements that I'm overlooking? Ms. Joe? Yes, uh, you can leave your communion cups, and they will be collected after service. Uh, Ernie? I, I, I believe so. Thank you for saying that. Um, I think that this is a class that can appeal really to... Uh, to everyone, uh, youth and adults alike. So encourage uh, everyone who, uh, who can to be there for that. Any other announcements that need to be made? All right, well, if that's everything, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us in worship today. Uh, if you would be standing, and Chris will lead us in our closing song, we'll have our closing prayer. <clears throat> the first time I heard this song, I was in chapel in preaching school. And a brother from South Carolina by the name of Michael Felder led, led it. He was a bear of a man, a great bass voice. But he sung this song with such passion and with such feeling that I hope I do him justice this morning. Sing with me. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me. Where could I go but to the Lord? Neighbors are kind, I love them every one. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand. With friends I love so dear, we inferred I give from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to?
to the Lord. Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where's the smile? If you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. I tell you, as I look back over this group and see the smiles and the, the bright faces, and after I've gone through the service today, man, am I uplifted and encouraged. Thank everyone for being here. Know that you matter. You matter. As as you a part of humanity, and as part of this church. Shall we pray together, please? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, I look over this audience and I know they're here because they love you. And not only that, dear Heavenly Father, but they realize what you did when you came to this earth and you ultimately died for the sins of the world. You arose, Heavenly Father, from the grave and you made a promise to come back to claim your church. Oh, Heavenly Father, Thank you for all the promises that you have made us. Thank you for how you care for us each and every day of our life. And Father, as we depart, I pray that we can lift our voices and proclaim it's good to have been in the house of the Lord. Lord, I, I appreciate Lee a young man striving to serve you and not only, Lord, to serve you but to preach the word and his dear wife, Heavenly Father. I know as a minister that you've got to have the support of your wife in order to do the job you need to be done. Bless our leadership. Bless each and every person. Lord, we all have our ups and our downs, our peaks and our valleys. But we pray that you would guide us through life. And when things are placed before us that are sinful, that we might flee from it. That we might cling to those things that are righteous and holy. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we know that you love us. So watch over us as we travel home today. Be with us this week, Lord, and, and uh, help us to deal with issues. And Lord, would you just place, just place an individual in our lives that we can let your light shine and they would glorify you in heaven. For these things I ask in your son's name, amen. You want me to sing a special now? <laughs>